I guess it, what I'm going to actually refer to a little bit more tonight that is uh, 1900, as Lynn keeps putting it, and try really try more to give the background as to you know what what 19 why 1900 was important, you know. Uh, what, hap what happened that he's referring to and what it meant uh, as much as I can get it across. And I will focus a little bit to give people a sense of the two figures. Hilbert, who in some ways is he's a, a, more significant than he might seem. He's not as <laughs> significant as Russell. And maybe even try to give people a deeper sense of Russell. Because, you know, I, 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 Lynn has recently said, you know, we shouldn't just throw words around. And, you know, Russell's the most evil man of the 20th century, and he wanted to bomb the Russians. And then we have the quotes on depopulation and so on and so forth. Now, I, there's two points to be made. First of all, this is real. I mean, Russell was certainly ranked as the most evil intended person of the 20th century. And in a certain sense had a more evil impact than almost anybody else in the 20th century. You know, it, you know in other words, Hitler killed, you know, he, the truth of the matter is, uh, uh, you know, a, a point I like to make is we talk about extinction wars and we are headed for an extinction war. But World War II was a bloody mess. There was nothing nice <laughs> or, about World War II. World War II was brutal. It was violent. It was destructive. And uh, it was the most destructive war in human history, by far. Not even close. Probably 100 million people died. Now, you got to also keep in mind, at the time, the total population of the world was about 2 billion. So you're talking about a war that killed about 5% of the world's population. And whatever other consequences existed. I mean, these numbers are a little mind-boggling. Like, Russia was about 180 million people. Uh, eight and a half million died in combat, by their count. And about 20 million civilian died. died. That's so you're, you know, that's about 15% of the population. And it, let alone the consequences. The consequences of these things are far reaching. I always used to make the point, which these days probably the Russians wouldn't like and the feminists wouldn't like, but the truth of the matter is one of the reasons it, in, in the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s and 80s is you had women physicists and women doctors and women surgeons because the men were dead. <laughs> That's part of why it happened. Yeah. So th th this thing was devastating. Germany went through something similar. For example, Germany's population today, the combined population of East and West, so the com unified Germany today, is about the same size as Germany was in 1933. The total population gain has not been that much, if, if much at all. So admittedly, we're talking about an extermination war with six or seven billion people. But this was a, a, an atrocity of an enormous scale. 10 million Chinese. We, we, uh, I don't think the fact that China was in World War II even registers for most of us. <laughs> it's sort of, yes, maybe something was going on. You know, maybe you heard of the rape of Nanjing, but probably about 10 million Chinese died. So th this was not a joke. This was not, and you know, I also would like to uh, try to disabuse people of all kinds of things, because, you know, we have the famous World War II generation, the, you know, the greatest generation according to Tom Brokaw. You know, <laughs> Lynn has certainly referenced the advantages of the World War II generation. On the other hand, the World War II generation was very problematic. You know, uh, Roosevelt is often criticized 
for not joining the war soon enough on the question of the Holocaust, you know, and other things. The truth of the matter is, Roosevelt was aching to get into the war in this case. He hated Hitler. <laughs> but he couldn't because of the American population. The American population was isolationist, didn't want to spend the money. And one way to, I think I mentioned this the other day, one, one way <coughs> to realize, now of course also it, it's a lesson about Congress. At a certain point, Congress is worse than the people. They're more pragmatic, they're looking to who's going to win votes, and they get more propitiatory capitulationist than even the population. Good example of this, however, which does reflect the population, and I, is that after the Selective Service, now the draft was instituted in September of 1940. Now, however, or maybe it was July, anyway, in 1940, however, or 41, uh, yeah, 40. Uh, however, the, uh, it was only a one-year mandate, and there was a limit as to how many people could be in the war, that could be drafted. Only up to 900,000, okay? And it was one year. There was a, a, the, the slogan of the draftees was Ohio. Not Kilroy was there, here, it was Ohio. Over the hill in one year. <laughs> okay, or I, I think over the hill the 1st of October, something like that. In other words, they were going to get the hell out in one year. Now, when Roosevelt went to renew the draft, at least according to one story, he was fearful. He didn't want to do it right away because he thought the isolationists would win the vote. This is, it's actually the renewal of the draft that's the famous vote because what happened was they did an organizing drive, people like Hopkins and Marshall and Roosevelt, and they twisted a lot of arms, and the, select, the draft passed by one vote. Now this had a, you can imagine the impact this had on the European, you know, on the British, on the Russians. That wasn't a great vote of confidence coming from the United States. And this is why you, you get some of this idiocy about, you know, <coughs> Roosevelt drew the Japanese into the war because he wanted to go to war. You know, this kind of freaky stuff, you know, is the kind of stuff that we should pay no heed. That we get from a lot of the perimeters of our contacts and so on and so forth. And in the 20th century was a mess. This wasn't even the better days of, you know, the 19th century. We can talk about the Civil War, the, the post-Civil War period. I'll mention a few things. The, the reality is the 20th century has been a mess. <clears throat> in particular, if you want to look at it, a point that I think is important is World War I. Because World War I demoralized the hell out of uh, certainly European civilization. And really, probably more than that. Certainly Sun Yat-sen was affected by it. This was the, it, it, the, the, the introduction of this kind of brutal war just a meat grinder of a war, where there was no purpose to it. This was a conflict generated by the British Empire using a certain amount of conflict between empires, or between people who aspired to empire, or a dying empire like the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> and, you know, Edward VII came in and constructed World War I. Why? We, these are things that I think are worth repeating, we used to say quite frequently. Because there was a policy of developing the Eurasian landmass. There was a certain potential, I, possibly not as great as we now have today, but there was a potential with Vita, Mendeleev, Bismarck up until he was removed, for the development of the entire Eurasian landmass. This was certainly the policy of people like John Quincy Adams. The policy of moving across the Pacific to Asia and in a sense defeating the European oligarchy by that development. 
<laughs> and one of the characteristics of this development was more people. And while depopulation is sort of a, a more explicit policy today, the policy of the British Empire in the 19th century was kill people. They killed Indians in tens of millions on a number of occasions. They were the perpetrators of the slave trade, which killed millions of Africans, not a few hundred thousand in the United States, or four million different calculations, but millions of people in Africa. That was the policy. They were the first ones to create concentration camps in the Boer War in the late 1890s. They took, believe it or not, they took Dutch Calvinists and put them in concentration camps. So yeah, it, it, the British Empire created World War I, and what came out of this was this idea that Western civilization, science, was a disaster. Science was bad. Human development, this is the beginning of the idea that hadn't really existed that much. That human development was a problem. Progress was bad. Look what progress did. It led to World War I. It destroyed the European continent. Existentialism comes out of World War I. Logical positivism was, you know, its hegemony was certainly moved by World War I. <clears throat> And what you had before that was an explicit conception uh, which was generated by an attack on science and the human mind. What you, the, the, the thing to get across about people like Russell in particular and Hilbert in a certain way is that they did not believe that the human mind had any unique power in the universe. And I'll tell you, it becomes a very important thing to be able to identify creativity as such. In other words, this is not about having the right sentiment about people. I like people, I'm gregarious, or anything else of that nature. This is a relative, this is a precise scientific question, uh, uh, debate. Not only are human beings good, they are necessary for the development of the planet. Human progress is essential to human existence. We don't exist without progress. That's at the core of Lynn's economics. If you look at the Hamiltonian question, you know, what Lynn has recently said about Hamilton is even more, it means even been implied in the past. But Hamilton had a conception of economics, physical economy, but economics that was totally different. What was the core of his economic outlook? The core of his economic outlook was the development of the powers of labor, or what he called artificial labor. The development of the powers of labor through scientific and technological growth, which was based on the, our knowledge of, of, of the powers of the universe. That's economics. <laughs> the really tough question in economics is how do you measure the growth of creativity? Or how do, you, how do you know what a policy is that generates <laughs> development? And ultimately, this is, this is the scientific question that was blocked in the 20th century. Because where were we by the end of the 19th century? The question really was, what are the un, what's the underlying <laughs> fundamental scientific causality that unifies the galactic or the cosmic and the infinitesimal or what we learn to think of as the atomic. Think of Riemann's habilitation paper, 1857 or so. What does he say in there? He says specifically that the, the, the core of human knowledge resides in the macroscopic or the astrophysical or the microphysical. That it's, it's a question of 
knowing what it exists in nature <coughs> at those levels that defines scientific progress, that also defines what, what he understood to be mathematics as compared to what we understood, came to understand at the end of the 19th century as mathematics. Because one of the, one of the core approaches of the operations against science, typified by logical positivism, empiricism, Russell's approach to the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, creating a logical system for mathematics, but this was meant to be the language of science. That's the whole point of this. You need a precise language to express scientific truth. So you need a logical, limited, precise set of words and rules about the words to express scientific principles. Ultimately, what they <coughs> set is a mathematical standard of truth to which Everything, science, the human mind, has to exceed. Now, it's worth noting, since Lynn has been uh, made, made a, a good deal of a point about the history of the presidency, from the point he got out of World War II, the India, the Burma, China, India theater, and so forth, it's also the case that as soon as he came out, approximately 1948, he took upon himself as a uh, industrial manager and so on and so forth, he took upon himself a polemic against people like Shannon and Wiener and uh, Morgan Stern. Game theory, the application of game theory to economics. The application of, uh, you know, rocket science to economics. Literally, in the case of Wiener. <laughs> That what they, they, their uh, uh, outlook was that you could reduce Adam Smith, who had already reduced human beings to pleasure. Remember, what's the big thing that he says in the oft-quoted pa uh, paragraph? Don't use your mind. This is explicit. You know, so I think sometimes there is the old, uh, what do you call it, um, the, uh, the post or you know, the letter, uh, 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 Perloin letter. You know, this thing is, it, it, that, that paragraph says, the key thing in economics is don't use your mind. Don't try to define a, don't pr define a future orientation toward which you want to direct economic activity. That's the exact opposite of Hamilton. Who said that? Who said that? Smith. Smith. Okay. You know, it, it all is, leave it all in the hands of the great director blah 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 and he says don't use don't try to plan anything don't try to project a future just go by what you feel I mean that that could be you know I uh, sometimes uh, that could be the slogan of the 20th century <laughs> how do you feel about it it's it's pervasive we all give in to it at some point or another, you know, except maybe Lynn, which is why he says some of what he has to say, because most of us capitulate at some level to how we feel, or how they feel, or how they're going to feel, or how we feel like they're going to feel. <laughs> Do they know that we know that they feel the way we think we, they, they feel? I mean, that's, that's one of the great conundrums of organizing. Because we already know what they're going to feel, so why bother to try to tell them what you know? That's simply not going to work, prima facie. <laughs> In some ways, you can see what the great debate is, you know. Lynn thinks it's going to work, a lot of us think it's not going to work, and therein <laughs> lies the whole debate. <laughs> How do they feel? I think of this stuff, like, you know, I saw this thing, I have to bring up crazy cultural things because they, they make me laugh anyway. You know, in Columbia University, this is one of the seats, for God save Hamilton, this was where he graduated, right? They had a graduation, I think, a couple days ago, and they brought a mattress. Oh, that's the girl with the mattress. That's the girl that's with the mattress. Being raped, yeah. What? what? Huh? Yes. 
Well, basically, so the story is this. Well, the, to understand the story, you have to understand culture in the United States today. One of the big things is that you know some wild percentage. Now, the men in the audience. You're just going to have to give it up. But anyway, the, uh, the idea, it, it, basically what's happened is, you know, some huge percentage of all sexual activity on American campuses is actually rape. It's not consensual sex. Eight, 18, 19 year olds no longer consent to sex, particularly the women. They say, no, we're being raped across America. Okay, now probably there's a lot of bad stuff going on. So. There's been all these suits brought and so on. So there's a woman at Columbia who's been carrying out a protest by putting, lying on her mattress in the middle of the Columbia University campus. This is not a joke. With clothes on? With clothes on. Because <laughs> she didn't want to be, you know, I mean, I make sure that. <laughs> the, uh, So they brought this symbolically to the graduation. And I, I kid you not. Well, there are pictures all over the place. Yes. You see, I, I happen to be a person who believes that you might as well know what's going on out there. Because if you think you're protected by it, <laughs> you're wrong. Unless you're going to go to some, you know, utopian uh, agricultural something or other somewhere. This is what these people, this is what's going on. And of course, there's, you know, you have crazy stuff on all sides of this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, this is what people are preoccupied with. This is what goes on on campuses. In a lot of cases, if you go into a campus with an idea that you're really passionately committed to, you might find that you get a certain se section of people who flock to it, because everything else there is crazy. It's completely insane. That's what people are going through. And uh, you know, they, they, it, a lot of it's their fault. But the, the, the reason for this is the 20th century, I, you know, people don't like, yes, we, I know it's, it's been done by this person and that person. But the fact is, this is the culture of the 20th century. For example, you know, people will argue about this and will have religious views and so on and so forth. You've got to face the fact that even some of your best people can't really uh, argue that we aren't evolved from animals. They can say, I believe human beings are different. They can say, I believe they have a spark of the divine. But what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. They have no idea what that spark of the divine is. Do they, do they connect that to scientific progress? Do they connect that to the ability to develop South America or Africa? No, they don't. They may connect it to an iPhone. <laughs> What's a smart, uh, uh, smart economy? It's 50 more ways to entertain yourself. You know, if you can put more entertainment on your phone, then that's some kind of productive activity. You've produced something. People have no idea of production. In the United States, in most places, they don't produce anything. And the idea is produce less and less. You know, I happen to come from Baltimore. Actually, I was raised in the death zone. No, it wasn't the death zone when I was raised there, <laughs> but, you know, Park Heights Avenue, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, as Lynn said, it was a place where you had hundreds of thousands of manufacturing workers. You had a port. You had uh, Sparrows Point, which at the time was the largest steel plant in the, quote, free world. 40, 50,000 steel workers. You had one of the biggest ports on the East Coast. General Motors, Black & Decker, Westinghouse, Martin Marietta. Now there's 600,000 people and virtually no manufacturing. That's the kind of, that, that's what we, we we, we've forgotten some of this. You want to know what happened in Baltimore? They have whole high schools in Baltimore that are dedicated to teenage single mothers. That's that, in other words, whole classes are teenage single mothers. So, you know, this is, this is 
one of the poorest places you could imagine as an American city, but it was once a productive manufacturing center. I think that's more and more in part why Lynn is saying we have to do this in New York. There ain't that much left in the country. You can pick and choose a few spots. And the country has been dominated by a Confederate takeover. Uh, you have two points uh, of the Confederate takeover. One was the end of the 19th century, Jim Crow, the, the, the murder of McKinley, and so on and so forth. And as far as I'm concerned, the second phase of it was Nixon. And there were, it, what happened after the so-called 1960s is that the Republican Party and the presidential campaigns became more and more dominated by the South. That was Nixon's strategy. Yeah. That was the idea, the solid South. Take the South away from the Democrats. But the biggest problem the Democrats had under, for example, FDR was the Southern Democrats. So they finally went over to the Republican side, and that's what you got. That's what happened in Texas. That's what happened throughout the South. But the whole, the whole period, and one of the other high points of this period that's worth discussing, and I'll, I'll come back to a point about Einstein, is that this whole idea <coughs> that we cannot know the truth, except for analytic truth, deductive truth, that anything is, that isn't deductively true isn't really knowledge. And the standard of truth is deductive truth. In other words, it, you know, the, the, actually the model for truth that came, and it's not even just in mathematics, that comes up is the idea, for example, a four-legged animal has four legs. I mean, it, that's a call, considered an analytic truth. You don't need some big diagram for this stuff. And those are the only things that we can know are true. This became the standard, and I'll give, I'll give you in a minute one of the interesting ideas of how this fight was waged. I mean, for example, Leibniz talks about analytic truth. But for Leibniz, there are truths that one finds by the, by the human mind's replication of the unfolding of creative development in the universe, like evolution of, of uh, 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 the human being from childhood on, there's an evolutionary process that we can uh, that we can grasp, that we're a part of. You get this in a number of different ways, or you get uh, you get the same thing in the 18th century, where there's a concept of a certain kind of mathematical truth that can be useful, and you might want to translate some scientific discovery into a mathematical language for purposes of, of transmitting it. But the idea that, that truth is limited to analytic certainty, which also, by the way, is why everybody thinks there's no truth in culture. What's the truth in music? <clears throat> can, you give me a, can you give me a definition of truth in music? Is there a way to prove that from a beginning theme the follow that everything else should follow as a deductive sequence of notes? No. So we have truth in science, which is mathematical, which is deductive, which is can be at least 100% certain, or you can put it in that form. And then you've got art. And art is just how it's something else. It's, since it's not deductive, it doesn't have a standard of truth. We come back to how do you feel? Now, at the Solvay conference, the real thing that was imposed, we, you can go through all the technical features, we can discuss more of that a, a, another time if we get together again, but at what happened at Solvay was that Bohr, but in particular Born and Heisenberg, proposed that the peculiarities of, qua uh, of quantum physics the oddities of quantum physics. In particular, the, the big oddity is not what everybody thinks it is. It's not just that it's 
quantized or it's not the more uh, spectacular things of non-local uh, causality, if there is such a thing, but that you, do, you never can know when an electron will jump from one orbit to the next. You can never know when it might radiate a photon or something of that sort, some of the basic forms of radiation. That's random. That's the fundamental problem that, that essentially starts with quantum physics or quantum mechanics. The idea that things occur in quanta is not news. And there are discrete phenomena. We do use counting numbers. In fact, Kepler's conception of the solar system, you could say, is quantized. In other words, there are, there are reasons that the orbits exist where they are and couldn't be in between or have the form that they do. That's a harmonic ordering of the space. So it has a certain discrete quality to it or a discrete feature. But what's, what occurs in, the, in quantum mechanics is randomness. And so what Born and Heisenberg and Bohr do is, and there are, there are a lot of things going on at this point, the determination of the orbits, uh, of the atomic, the, uh, the, the atomic orbits, the way they change, what this does to the binding forces in chemical reactions, and so on and so forth. These were all discoveries. Now the question became, okay, what's the physics of this actually? What, what, is, what is going on here? What can we say about the way in which these uh, 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 radiation, the way these electrons jump, what can we say about this? Because it affects, at a certain level, it affects everything that we think about the universe. Well, their point, and he, you see, their point was, okay, we have the mathematics. And this is basically matrix mathematics. It's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it uses, in fact, they use Riemannian tensors because a tensor is really a matrix of the coefficients of the different degrees of freedom, the different, you could say, dimensions or something along those lines. Because despite what people think about in an equation, the fundamental aspect is not the variables. I mean, it's important to know how many variables you have. But the, what tells you something are the so-called coefficients. Because it tells you that the variables occur in certain ratios. So if you have some equation like 2x plus 5y equals 19 or whatever, okay, what you really are, know is that the ratio of 2 in the x direction is to 5 in the y direction, and that ratio produces a result of 19. So basically what you do in a matrix is you take these coefficients, and they have certain relations. In a tensor, you're dealing with a lot of different directions, so to speak. So they, uh, their point is you've got a matrix mathematics of this sort that can, we can use to describe quantum mechanics. And then it, a couple of other interesting things turn up, like uh, the fact that, you, that there's a form of wave equations that Schrodinger comes up with that can be shown to be equivalent to the matrix mathematics. So the mathematics, different mathematics come to the same, are really equivalent, okay? Now, at this point, the argument that Born and Heisenberg and Bohr make is that that's all we know. All we have is the mathematical description. To ask what is physically going on is the wrong question. It's a non-allowed question, because the human mind can never get to what's going on in reality. We have to give up the idea of causality. We have to recognize that the universe is fundamentally random. And all we can do is deal with the mathematics of random activity. And indeed, what do they do in random activity? This is what von Neumann did. Von Neumann uh, was one of the people who developed the, uh, you could say, the equations that approximate randomness. 
They're not really random, but you can get closer and closer to random. <laughs> like one of the most difficult things to do is to generate a random sequence of numbers. Even machines have a hard time doing it. Because it, it, inevitably, it produces a pattern of some kind or other. So we even have to approximate randomness. Now this was the debate between Einstein, Planck, to a certain extent, and but Einstein directly. And it was a setup. Einstein was, sent, was, was basically bombarded. And this is part of the way Bohr operated. Bohr, uh, first of all, he couldn't write. His mother and his wife wrote most of his stuff down. But the way he dealt with people, and Schrodinger is a good example. Schrodinger visited him at one point, And they had this difference. And Schrodinger wasn't feeling well. Yeah, I guess he had the flu or something. So he was so somewhat bedridden at this vacation home. And Bohr, maybe properly uh, named, <laughs> Bohr would come in, sit at the end of the bed, and basically harass him for hours on end. <laughs> Effectively put him in an, a, in an adversarial con, uh, situation and pound away at his arguments on why you know it was the mathematics. And of course, Bohr's famous himself, in some way, a little different for the complementarity theory. That is, what he's, his, the way he argued is sometimes what we're getting is something that acts like a particle. And sometimes we're getting something that acts like a wave. You know, in particular, the thing that people know is the, is the interference phenomena. So if you take an electron, which is a particle, and you shoot it through a slit, over time, the electron will give you a pattern of interference as though it was a light wave. So you get these dualities. And you know, it's a, my point is not just throw out the duality. The fact is you have to figure out how do you deal with the duality? What are we dealing with here? So, you know, so um, Bohr's argument was when you deal with it as a particle, you have to deal with it as a particle. That you have to think of it as a particle, you have to use all the mathematics for, the, uh, for its behavior as a particle, and you can't, do, you can't use any of the wave mechanics to describe what's going on. When you treat it as a wave, you have to treat it as a wave, and you can't use any of the mathematics uh, that, uh, or that reflect its particle nature. So you can see this is a pretty insane world. But he's saying, it may be insane, but that's all, we can, that's all we have. In fact, in a case like a guy like Bohr might even admit, some of these guys surprise you. You know, they say, yes, well, it is crazy. But that's just the way it is. It's, think of it, it's essentially a barrier beyond which the human mind cannot go. Now, of course, and of course, everybody's fascinated by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Fundamentally, it doesn't amount to all that much. Or let me put it to you in a shockingly different way. It's no different than the kind of dilemma in epistemology that's always existed. In other words, we as human beings, is there anything that we can do that we don't affect? Can we actually find a place where we would be able to be completely external observers? simply receiving data, maybe, or, or looking at what's uh, to inside the box. Think of the universe as a box, and somehow we're trying to find a corner of the universe or some place outside the universe, and we're going to watch the universe as a thing in itself and find out how it works. You can't do it. The uncertainty principle is simply based on the idea that in the observation of atomic or subatomic particles, the light wave is bigger than the particle, or it's big enough that in observing the object, you're changing its momentum, or you're changing its location. So it's a, it's a standard epistemological problem. We have, we've had that problem since the very beginning. Parma, uh, Plato has it in the Parmenides. It, as soon as you try to observe something in motion, you either 
stop it and say, well, it's here. But as soon as you observe it, it's moved. If you try to get its motion, you can't get where it is. If you try to, if you try to stop its motion, like the famous arrow in Zeno's paradox, what happens? It falls. <laughs> so the issue is always, how do we find actions that we undertake, understanding that we're in the universe? I really like this thing by this guy, Nir Shavi. You know, because what do people think about the galaxy? <laughs> the galaxy is out there. It's somewhere out there. Mm -hmm. You don't think of it. The galaxy is here. <laughs> this is the galaxy. <laughs> Not only are we in the galaxy, this is the galaxy. <laughs> we don't have to go out there to get to the galaxy. <laughs> the galaxy came here. <laughs> and in some ways, that's the point about... You know, w rain, water, I, you know, all, all, it's going on. So, you know, it, w w the, the real issue is to be able to think in terms of human action and what we know about human activity and use what we know about human activity and development to ask the right questions through our activity, or the right experiments. And by the way, the experiments are the basis of the machine tools. For, I, you know, we often <laughs> criticize certain things, but take, take this thing they now have, we almost had one in Texas, the Large Hadron, Colli Hadron Collider, Collider in uh, CERN in, on the Swiss-French border. I mean, the amount of machining that went into that machine is huge. You're talking about beams of huge amounts of energy, super magnets that weigh tons, and you've got to shape the flow of the beam with the magnets so that there, it doesn't give off too much radiation and there's still enough energy in it when they collide. Now whether that's a good method is another question, but I assure you that these machines, uh, and all these experimental machines, aerospace, medical equipment, that's what all this stuff comes out of. Again, this is the kind of thing that in the culture today, nobody thinks about. Nobody even cares about. Now what happened, it, it, I'm going to give you a sense of Russell in particular. Because I want you to understand, the intention here is evil. Now I, I got one funny thing, because Russell, and one of the terrible things about Russell is he lived a, a long time. <laughs> okay, Lynn has five years to catch up with Russell. Mm. Russell lived from uh, 1872 to 1970. But what I really found funny, yeah, that's part of why he was one of the most evil. <laughs> <laughs> a long time you work at it. Right. So Russell, this is a, a guy writes his uh, his biography two-volume biography, and he's a British philosopher, a guy named Ray Monk. He's still alive. So he writes this about 20 years ago, I think. Um, now, you get, partly, he's, he, this guy's got his own problem, but uh, I want to give you a, this is a guy who <coughs> loved Russell, typical British philosopher. In writing this book, I have had to confront, in a way that is new to me, my own reactions to my subject. For ten years, I have, as it were, lived with Russell, and for the most part, it has been an uncomfortable experience. I find him inexhaustibly fascinating, and there are things about him that I admire tremendously. But as I have worked on this volume, two thoughts have dominated my reactions to him, which, I am aware, may have distorted my account of his life. The first is just how bad most of his writing on political, social, and moral questions is. <laughs> Few who know Russell from his great writings on logic have taken the trouble to read the vast quantity of journalism that he produced in the second half of his life. Those who do would, I think, be shocked at how sloppy and ill-considered much of it is. The second thought that has come to dominate my reaction to Russell, particularly in the latter part of his life, is how emotionally maimed he was. Mm. He was, it sometimes seems, simply not capable of loving another human being. 
Russell had what he considered to be an exalted conception of love, which he expressed in marriage and morals and in numerous other places. He was a sexual idiot. Uh, his be one, at one point, his best friend was D.H. Lawrence, and he was into free love. And Anyway, according to which love takes the form of merging one ego with another. In many of his political writings, this notion reappears as the duty to love humanity in the sense of regarding all mankind as, in some sense, coextensive with one's own ego. <laughs> one might regard this as harmlessly fanciful way of urging people to empathize with each other. But Russell's relations with those close to him suggest another interpretation, that he was unable to conceive of loving a person unless he could regard that person as part of himself. In other words, loving another was, for him, inconceivable. He was, as it were, as indeed his epistemology maintains we all are, trapped inside the boundaries of his own ego. He could imagine, and frequently did imagine, extending those boundaries. But what he could not imagine was reaching out beyond them. Would that this were only a theoretical problem. But the experience of Russell's wives, children, and friends suggests that on this point, Theory and practice combined in the most devastating manner. Okay, now, and, and this is a, a, a favorable biography. <laughs> a guy who, who started the job thinking this is one of the great minds of the 20th century. Okay, now that's an ad hominem argument, but ad hominem arguments have some virtue when you can combine them with, who this, with other aspects of his philosophical outlook. Because... The fa Russell's famous Principia Mathematica, which is, you know, something like 11 volumes. He's, he's got a shorter version of it called The Principles of Math. I think it's 13 volumes. The Principle of Mathematics. Okay. What his basic idea is not complicated. The idea was that you could reduce all of arithmetic, arithmetic, to a logical system. Well, a lot of you actually got a set theory. In other words, you start out with the null set, the set that has nothing in it, and that's the first mathematical object. Then you take, really, if you, if you want to be completely abstract, you take the set that contains the set of the, that's the empty set, and then you take the set of the set, and so on and so forth. And you can build all of arithmetic on this. A few rules. The model is somewhat the Euclidean axiomatic system, but if anything, even more restrained. And now the real catch point is that the idea is you can reduce all of mathematics to arithmetic. It's a purely reductionist outlook. And all of physics can be reduced to mathematics. Therefore, effectively, all of the physical existence of the universe can be expressed in a simple axiomatic set theory or logical system. Now for the logical positivist, which Russell was the big, he was the father of it, or the grandfather. He wasn't technically in the movement, he created the whole system. For them, anything that isn't a direct sensory experience that is then incorporated in this kind of a system, thus the idea of logical positivism, is, and I think this is nonsense. It's not that it's wrong. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's meaningless. In other words, you don't, if I say God, you don't know what that, you really have no idea what I'm talking about. You may think you have an idea, but unless I can give you an experience that I have, that logically leads to the conclusion that God exists and has certain characteristics, you don't know what I'm talking about, and I have no idea what, you, what your idea is of what I'm talking about. It's called metaphysics. It's nonsense. In fact, there's the famous case of Wittgenstein, who was a student of Russell at a certain level. Some people think that you know, somehow Wittgenstein affected Russell. You know, I, I don't believe it. I mean, Wittgenstein was a product of Russell. He was an oligarch himself. He came from an oligarchical family. But Wittgenstein came to the conclusion that you couldn't say anything that had any serious meaning to it. 
at a certain point he quit, he became an, you know, a teacher and blah, 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 and then he came back and criticized his own work and much of what you know later on in the 20th century as linguistic analysis comes from Wittgenstein. It's just another version of the same thing. Now, for, on, the, on the political side, let me, let me make a point. Uh, on the political side, you look at World War I, and then I'm going to read you a few quotes about Russell, because Russell didn't just say one time, let's bomb the Russians. This was Russell's policy from 1945 to 1948. And he, he denied it until... Uh, a letter became public that he had written privately where he says we should use an atomic bomb on the Russians. Now, if you go to give you a sense of a political difference, besides the fact, you know, I don't know how many people know, Einstein never got security clearance during World War II. He worked a little bit for the Navy on shaped charges, but they wouldn't let him near anything else because he was considered politically suspect. Okay? That's part of the, I mean, Einstein was a, you know, a bird in a gilded cage in Princeton. I mean, he was, in a sense, brought there so he couldn't do anything. Because he was surrounded by people like Morgan Stern and Wiener uh, and so on and so forth. But anyway, during World War I, there was a, 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 a famous incident early in the war. As you may have heard, there was tremendous, you know, nationalism, if you want to call it that, but, you know, uh, countries were whipped into a pro-war frenzy to, you know, France, Germany, et cetera, et cetera, the British. And so the, the, uh, there was a case where a leading group of scientists in Germany signed a letter supporting the German position on the war. And uh, I don't know how, I don't remember the whole body of it, but it was about 92, 93 signers. There were only three, or two or three that didn't sign it. Einstein, a guy named Nikolai, and there might have been one other person. They then put out their own statement against the war and attempted to circulate it. And indeed, uh, this is sort of the beginning of Einstein being persecuted in Germany, because during the 1920s, as you had some of the rise of this upset around Versailles, he was uh, one of the people targeted as a you know Jewish relative, uh, Jewish physics, and that he had betrayed the homeland and so on and so forth. But he fought. Uh, he knew he was right on World War One. He knew that this was a disaster, including for Germany. And indeed, afterwards, he fought to bring Germany back in to the scientific community. But uh, the truth of the matter is, one of the most important things about World War One. And this period, this early 20th century, is that it destroyed an idea that existed, which was that somehow the global scientific community was, even though they could be patriots, nonetheless they were world citizens, as uh, you know Schiller might have said. That there was a community of science that worked for human progress, that had a, a, a dialogue of ideas that crossed national borders, and so on and so forth. And that was destroyed by World War I because many of these scientists were rallied into these patriotic fronts and supported the various different parts of the, uh, of the, uh, of the war, the various different nations. And they were pitted against each other. You know, one of the great ironies is that there's a leading chemist, a guy named Haber, uh, who was Jewish who is famous for actually developing um, uh, nitric, uh, yeah, uh, what do you call it? Anyway, uh, for, uh, fertilizer. Oh, it's it's, it's, it's a nitrogen fixing uh, capability, I forget the name. Ammonia, uh, what is it called? It's called the Haber Haber process, right. <laughs> anyway, um, he was a, a, a super German patriot and uh, he fought in World War I, he did all these things, and it turned out he, of course, produced some of what ultimately was used in the gas chambers. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that destroyed <coughs> the idea of, of a global scientific cooperation. Now, I want to give you, this is, compare 
Einstein's political, and also it's worth noting, when Einstein was offered the presidency of Israel, he turned it down. And one of the reasons he turned it down, he was pro-Israel, but he was always concerned. He wasn't that as pro, he, he thought, okay, they need a haven, we need a haven, the Jewish people and so forth, but he was very concerned that, that it would turn Judaism into a national uh, religion, a national outlook. That the, one of the virtues of uh, the Jewish population was their cosmopolitanism, which of course is what the Nazi, one of the things the Nazis hated. But they, like, they're, they're, they didn't have a state. They weren't attached. They were, in some sense, could be at least, uh, universal citizens. And so he was worried that with the, the development of a nation, this would create a different se a sense of identity in the world Jewish population, and he was right. Uh, but let me give you um, uh, a couple of quotes on the bomb. I don't, I don't want to overdo it, but... Okay, I think we're... This is in a Royal Empire Society. Wait a minute. Okay. In a series of... Sp uh, now when America had sole possession of the most devastating weapon mankind had ever known, the time seemed right to press this case more insistently that the U.S. use its military power to dominate the rest of the world, the only way to get peace. In a series of speeches and journalistic articles, beginning September 1945, Russell argued passionately that in order to preserve peace, America had to act firmly and immediately to impose its will on the rest of the world, and in particular, on the Soviet Union. This sounds fairly contemporary. Uh, also, anyway, uh, from the very beginning, these articles had a bellicosity that contrasted markedly with the pacifist views he had expressed in the 1930s. He was a pacifist about fighting the Nazis. Yeah. He was not on board early on. The, uh, later on, he turned against them. But in 36, 37, he was quite equivocal. Okay. Uh, uh, in an article called What Should the Brit Be British Policy to Russia in September of the same year, Russell argued that before long, Russia, no doubt, will have as good or bad a bomb as that of the Americans. It was of fundamental importance that Soviet power be contained quickly, and he asserted that this could not be achieved by a policy of appeasement such as we pursued toward Germany until after Munich. A month later, he published an article, What America Could Do With the Atom Bomb. Whatever measures are to be taken to prevent another world war must be taken during the brief period of American supremacy it must be enforced by a vigorous use of that supremacy. The immense power for good or ill conferred by the atomic bomb should be used by the Americans wisely and with no undue shrinking from the responsibilities which this power confirms. More blunt, I think Stalin has inherited Hitler's ambition for world dictatorship. One must expect a war between the United States and the USSR, which will begin with the total destruction of London. I think the war will last 30 years and leave a world without civilized people from which everything will have to be built afresh, a process taking, say, 500 years. There is one thing and one thing only which could save the world, and that is a thing that I should not dream of advocating. It is that America should make war on Russia during the next two years and establish a world empire by means of the atomic bomb. Hmm. Uh, I think a powerful alliance could turn to Russia and say it is open to you to join this alliance if you will agree to the terms. If you will not join us, we shall go to war with you. I am inclined to think that Russia would acquiesce. If not, provided this is done soon, the world might survive the resulting war and emerge with a single government, such as the world needs. Now then, a few months later, he says, I, I do, in a private letter, I do not think the Russia, Russians will yield without war. Uh, and he said, in this war, the Russians, even without atomic bombs, will be able to destroy all big towns in England. Nevertheless, even at such a price, I think war would be worthwhile. For I have no doubt that America would win in the end. 
and communism must be wiped out and world government must be established. And th this goes on for a couple of pages. Now, then he goes through a period of denial that he ever said any of this. Uh, embarrassingly for Russell, the, the letter to one of these guys was published in 1954, <laughs> soon after his blanket denials of ever having supported a preventative war. Five years later, in a t BBC interview, Russell was asked, is it true or untrue that in recent years you advocated a preventative war might be made against communism against Soviet Russia? Russell replied, it's entirely true, and I do not repent it. He went on to defend his earlier advocacy. America had the bomb, the threat of war against the Soviet Union, and even if necessary, the carrying out of that threat, uh, and so on and so forth. And then he did, so he says, uh, Russell publicly a advocated a policy of threatening the Soviet Union with atomic weapons on no fewer than 12 occasions between 1945 in 1948. So, you know, I, I, I know how these things go. You sort of think, well, we have this one quote from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. This was his policy until the Russians got the bomb. Then, Russell being Russell, he became the leader of the anti-nuclear movement, mm -hmm. which is what uh, some of the uh, our older members remember he was the head of SANE, okay, and he was one of the leading figures bringing the counterculture to American campuses. He went to these campuses. He was very tight at this point with uh, some of the Trotskyist uh, left-wing organizations, and of course the, his his role, first of all, was to form a, a, a world government. He was part of the Pugwash. He was one of the founders of the Pugwash movement. And the idea was to take all nuclear capability. Think about the negotiations with Iran today. So yeah, I don't want people to think this is some wild, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, somewhat es esoteric story. What was, it, it, it may not be a perfect version of it, but what Russell's idea was that you would have a one world government, as some people call it. But the main point would be that you would have a committee of nations, like the UN Security Council, that would control all of the nuclear capability globally. There would be a UN army, as well as policing force, and that all weapons would be controlled by this force. And their and nuclear technology would also be controlled by this grouping, because nuclear technology is, you know, demonstrably dual use, as we call it today. If you have the if you have a, a nuclear power, you have the ability to develop nuclear weapons. Eventually, so Russell's point was: is since human beings are so screwed up and so hopeless, what you really need is a single government of proper rulers, a, pr the, uh, a proper aristocracy of sorts, that would control all of effectively advanced science. So this is why Lin calls him the most evil man of the 20th century. He thinks nothing, we have the other quotes, but he, he, he represents the oligarchical outlook in probably its, its purest philosophical form. And indeed, this idea of a mathematical truth, and there's, there's more that could be going into otherwise. But for example, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Besides the Solvay situation, one of the, uh, let me give you a sense of where did this come from, this whole idea. Now, admittedly, it really, or how, what form did it take? What it comes from is the idea that there is no such thing as creative human knowledge. There is no creative activity. It's an Adam Smith world. That's why, the, look, the, this idea of the trans-Pacific pivot, okay, it's not just about surrounding China, that's true. But as Obama said, what remember what he said? We want to be hegemonic because we want to write the rules of world trade. We want to write the rules of world economics. He who controls finances controls the future. That's their view. 
What's, fi what's finances? It's credit. It's the future. The Adam Smith free trade system ties financial and economic values to something that cannot develop, that's fixed. A given system that is a, an unchanging system which you have to operate deductively within. You have to know what the rules are and therefore you can figure out what you can and can't do and what the consequences are. Those are the rules. You're, tr you're supposed to try to figure out what it is that makes a financial instrument go up in value or down in value. That's essentially the mission of a human being. Because that's how we survive. That's how we produce offspring. Think about how pe th people think about it. Think, you have to get an idea how much people think of themselves as animals. Because what do they have to do? They have to survive. They have to get their DNA reproduced. They have to have children who have a way of supporting themselves. So you want to make sure that your children you know, do well competitively. You want to give them all the backup you can. Teach them to go to the right college, get the right kind of degree, to get the right kind of job, so that they can do what you just did. And that's what's called thinking, or moral responsibility. That's why people are so small. Moral responsibility is going to church on Sunday or whatever else, taking care of your family, etc. That's moral re responsibility. There is nothing larger than that. And of course, indeed, you can't even do that if you don't, you, you, you fail at what you think you're doing. But that's what people reduce themselves to. And it's very, it, it becomes extremely critical to carry that policy out to convince people that there is nothing creative, not just unique, but we can discover what we need to discover. We can go and do what we need to do. We can find our place in the galaxy and, uh, uh, and, get, and discover the principles. And we do that by guaranteeing that our outlook on life is determined by that sense of what the human individual is. And that value in an economy is, is giving people the chance to be that kind of human being. And the more of them we have, the better off we are. Now, one of the things that happens, it happened in this, and I'll just give you, because this is something that would take longer, but I want people to have an idea also of Hilbert and this whole, you know, basically, look, what people have to understand is there has been a certain kind of progress. So sometimes you, you can go overboard and think, well, let's go back to the 18th century BC or something when everything was wonderful and we all had chariots or something, I don't know, whatever. Okay, or we could split the Red Sea or something, you know. Uh, there, you know, if you look at the last few hundred years, there's a great deal that's happened. We uh, whole areas of the universe have been opened up. For you know, we didn't, and I won't go through. We didn't know that galaxies even existed in the late 18th century. We, we thought there was one uni one galaxy, the Milky Way. So the Milky Way was the universe. In a certain sense, that's not the worst thing. But we learned a great deal more is out there and a great deal more about what is out there. Electromagnetism. Yeah, we've, we've had the capability of producing electricity for human use for 200 years, maybe. And for industrial use, significantly less than that. In maybe 140, 150 years. Most cities in the United States did not have electricity until 1870, 80, 90. Of course, rural United States didn't have electricity until the 1930s. Medicine as we know it today, with all of its flaws. I mean, think about what we can do. You can take something that was is produced by a certain radi radiation, a certain kind of radiation. You can use it in a machine or in the human body, and you can tell within a certain degree what the cells are doing, which ones are not operating properly. You can see all kinds of things inside the human body that you couldn't have even considered 30 or 40 years ago. 
So think of it, all of this really comes from the end of the 19th century. We wouldn't have computers, we wouldn't have the health care that we have, but more than that, we opened up an entire world. The radiation was something that people didn't know existed a little over 100 years ago. What we talk about, cosmic radiation, ions, beta decay, gamma rays, people knew nothing about this. Now there's a lot of, there's a big mess in uh, nuclear theory, but frankly, better that than not knowing anything. The problem is, at the point at which we began to discover this, and actually began to consider the idea of bringing the, uh, uh, the field conception, not only into astrophysics with Einstein and so forth, but effectively resolving what the nature of causality is that unifies the basic fields of, of uh, activity that we know. It doesn't mean a reductionism. Now, what's important about this? The problem that also occurs at the end of the 19th century is life and biology goes out of it. And the, the, think about it. The, what, what are we talking about in Vernadsky? Asymmetry, time uh, differentiation. This is all being looked at in the 1890s. Much of what we know about asymmetry in biology was known by the 1890s, by either uh, Pasteur or Curie. There hasn't been that much done. I mean, there are probably papers and so on and so forth, but there hasn't been that much decisive done. There's very little about, bi uh, about the relationship between the biotic and the abiotic. Why do certain isotopes function differently in the body? Why do certain processes occur in the body that don't occur naturally uh, and outside of the physiology of the human body. I mean, what, the one that I like is if you had a computer that did everything that the human brain did, the human central nervous system under the control of the mind, you know, so on and so forth, you, your, your head would fry. <laughs> the amount of heat produced by that kind of computer activity would just fry your entire your brain. See, it shows you how people are. A lot of this people don't realize because your computer doesn't produce that much heat. But if you go to the so the, root the rooting sources and whatever they call it, the uh, you know the, the center that servers. the servers, these things use up gigantic amounts of electricity mm -hmm. and produce an enormous amount of heat. So you know the fact of the matter is if you begin to look at the universe from the standpoint of life and creativity, one of the best points about looking about at, who, at us being in the universe, we're in the galaxy. The galaxy produced us. Therefore, there's something in the universe prior to us and in the universe as a whole that has the same character of the creative development that it's a characteristic of the universe as a whole. That doesn't get reduced to parts, but expresses itself in the parts. And that's where we have to go. What is it in the human body that allows a mind to be, part, to be carried around in a human body? Now, if we began to understand that, we'd be making not contributions to linear immortality, but we'd be changing the future in enormous ways. Now, in fact, what happened is you had a, a certain fluorescence with people like Gauss, Riemann, Wilhelm Weber, and that came under attack. In, in, in my view, a lot of what we have on the axiomatics and so forth is an attack almost explicitly on Riemann. But it's certainly Riemann and Gauss, and that at least what he represents, Leibniz, of course, you know, Russell writes in his history of Western philosophy an attack on Leibniz. Or put it this way, he tries to turn Leibniz into a logical positivist. He says that the real work that Leibniz did 
was the Characteristica Universale, looking for a universal language, uh, you know, a logical system. That that was Leibniz's real work. The rest, the monadology, the other stuff, that's just the fluff cover that he had to give people so he could go on with his work on logic and whatnot. So that was his critique of Leibniz. Uh, he, he, this is evil in the sense that, uh, that Russell hated creativity. Now at the same time, there was a concerted attack on Riemann that came from Gurdjieff. Felix Klein and Hilbert. Because the issue was, supposedly, Riemann was a bit of a sloppy mathematician. And a lot of his proofs aren't, weren't rigorous enough. And this was a problem in mathematics overall. And one particular example is the so-called Dirichlet principle, which basically says that there's a minimum surface, and uh, you can get the boundary conditions of the minimum surface and the uh, singularities in the surface uh, for every function. Now, Riemann's argument was, well, when we apply this in physics, and I, next time I'll read from Hilbert, when we apply this in physics, you're dealing with the real world, you know that that limit exists. You can assert its existence and apply the principle. Okay? It's not as though you're going to get closer and closer to the electric wire but never touch it. You're going to, that electric wire exists. The limit in a function exists, the boundary condition, the fence, whatever it is. So you can treat the, the mathematical function as though that limit exists. And it worked. It worked in electromagnetism, uh, really even before Maxwell and all this kind of stuff. Now, a group out of Göttingen, I don't know if Weierstrass was in Göttingen, but Klein, uh, Klein was a student of Weierstrass, a group out of uh, Göttingen said, no, Riemann is sloppy. He hasn't proven mathematically, deductively, that that limit exists. And for a long time, Riemann took it somewhat serious, or at least he verbally what he said was, OK, yes, there's a problem in the proof, but I'm going to still work with this, because the truth of it lies in the physics. And if it's true in the physics, then I feel liberated to use it in the mathematics. And so he continued to do this. So did Bill Weber in his work on elect, uh, you know, the electron and so on and so forth. So, but what, what the Göttingen crowd, Hilbert actually went, led in this, Klein was one, they redid Dirichlet's principle and gave it a proper mathematical proof. In, uh, in other words, they set up the conditions under which you could use the, the, the principle and those that you couldn't. And they kept setting up new conditions and finding out more about it. And then you could use it. What that did, nobody uh, didn't use it physically. But what they then argued is, we need a standard of truth in mathematics, which is the key to truth in science. And so you had a whole fluorescence at the end of the 19th century, what they call foundations, foundations of mathematics. Can we prove that a system is complete? Can we prove that a system is consistent? It's a sort of a, what's the meta theory of mathematics? And Hilbert established that as the mission of mathematics and science. <laughs> Establishing these consistency and completeness proofs on a logical, deductive basis. And that was meant as a constraint on the kind of thing that Riemann and ultimately somebody like Einstein did. Einstein, was contrary to what the mythology, was not a mathematician. He wasn't a brilliant <laughs> mathematician. I mean, he was a, a, a good mathematician compared to any of us. He was a, a creative mathematician. But he was a physicist. He didn't learn Riemannian mathematics until 1912. <coughs> when he had already been working on the general theory for five years. In a certain sense, he knew he needed a different way of expressing what he was working on. And so he went around and he ultimately, Grossman, a guy, you know, tutored him in Riemannian geometry, or at least Riemannian mathematics. But that's what it was. Now you can see, if you take Einstein out of the picture, 
if you outflank him, so to speak, if you, if you run him through this solvay, we prove that he was wrong. He couldn't answer the questions. And it is true from that point on. If you read many, many scientists, it might shock you. Some will say, yes, he was a genius, but he ran out of gas. You know, others will say explicitly he was, uh, you know, he was a flash in the pan. He had a good year. Maybe he had another good year in 1915, but he just couldn't keep up. And at the same time, you do the same thing with somebody like Planck. You introduce a theory of the abiotic, and you have a reductionist approach to science overall. And the theory of the abiotic is explicitly irrational. And the argument is, it works. And it, within certain limits, it does work. But don't, yes, there are things we can do. It's a useful tool. But I'll tell you, there's a lot that doesn't work. There's a lot, for example, you've probably heard about dark matter. And here's the interesting case, the, the interesting thing you have to ask yourself, because this is often posed, and it is somewhat fascinating. You know, they'll admit that given the present equations, and given the basic theory of the Big Bang, now you have to ask yourself, where did the Big Bang, let's not go there for the moment, but you know, the, because you know, they say you're rolling the clock back and you're going, you know, so okay, now you're at the Big Bang and you, you follow it out, okay, and you're supposed to now get stars and galaxies and so on. The problem is the main force that you're working with is gravity that clumps things after they kind of blows apart then it's supposed to clump everything together. And, the, and of course, you've always got billions of years for everything to happen. It's sort of like evolutionary theory. You know, if you say, well, how did that happen? They say, well, you had millions and millions of years, so all, all these changes. <laughs> it, it, there's really no proof that all those changes add up to anything. A Talk about a lack of a proof. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, in order for these galaxies to form that we even know of, you need more matter. You need more matter to have the gravitational attraction to pull enough together to form a star or a galaxy or whatever. We're only short, you know, about 70% of the matter. And we're also short maybe 90% of the energy. There's new things that have come up. <laughs> My favorite one is that, uh, and they actually glibly do say, of course, I guess there's a, but they do say this. My fa favorite one is if you take the energy of this expanding universe with some new factors that they put in, they're off by 10 to the 23rd. They, I think they either have too much or too little energy by 10 to the, I think it's too much, by 10 to the 23rd. Because they're in a Right? Now, the interesting thing about the thing about the missing matter is why do we assume that it's matter? Why don't we think that there might be a wrong theory here? If you're off by 70% of the matter, it's at least considerable that you have to be allow yourself to think. See, this is where it becomes a constraint. You, I, a lot of scientists will talk about new physics, new ideas, new theories. The problem is they always think of these things as new additions to the given existing view. So it's a little bit like the, the guy who wants to add an epicycle. He says, well, look, you know, your picture of Mars isn't quite right. But I think if we just a add this in and that in, it it'll come out all right. Now, when you're dealing with a mathematical model, you can do that whenever you want. <coughs> when you're dealing with something like the amount of matter in the universe, so they be, uh, this is how it happens. They say, well, maybe it's the neutrinos. Then they figured out it wasn't the neutrinos. <coughs> then they, I guess they, then they had weakly interacting mass of particles called WIMPs. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, I'm not joking. That's, that's not a joke. Those are the best jokes. Uh, they, uh, and, uh, and, and the like. The constraint on people is you can't say, well, well, let's look and see. Maybe we should think so about some other way of looking at what's going on, or some other history of the universe. Some people have done that, but it's rare and they get clobbered. They really do get clobbered. That's not a joke. So science has been wrecked by this. 
this is where you get this thing about cl climate change. They have a computer model. What's a computer model? It's a mathematically deductive system. You know what the basic digital computer is? A basic digital computer is what they call a Turing machine. Now a Turing machine, what it can do is it can look at a tape, it can uh, erase what's on the tape, it can put a, a one on the tape. It can move to the right or it can move to the left. Now, you can do all of arithmetic. Admittedly, it would be boring and laborious and take a lot of these Turing machines and so on and so forth, but you can do all of arithmetic on a Turing machine. Effectively, any computer including a supercomputer, can be modeled by a Turing machine. Now, the, the, the interesting thing to me is how much artificial intelligence is being discussed a lot. It's sort of been revived in the last five years. Because why? Because computers have massive calculating capability. I mean, they, you know, you have super massive parallel processing. You have certain improvements in the hardware, which is real. And you have certain improvements in the, the software programming. Basically, when they, they can they can model neural networks, and so you can get things in terms of transmissions back and forth that are a little more sophisticated than they used to be. But they amount to nothing but, or another way to look at it is what they call a recursive function, which is the same thing. You know, basically all these things can be reduced to a function where you plug the the uh, the value that you get back in as the argument for the function. And it, obviously that can get fairly complicated because you can plug two things back in and you can make the function more complex. But that's what it amounts to and that can be reduced to a Turing machine. There is no creativity possible in a computer. Not possible. Maybe we could produce artificial intelligence if we get to the point that we can produce human beings by some other technique. Maybe that's possible, I, I don't know. But we're not gonna produce it with, these, with the comp a, a binary system or anything like that. The biggest thing you have to know about computers to deal with them fundamentally is they're stupid. That's why they do those things that drive you a little crazy and make you feel stupid. Because it just won't do anything but what it's programmed to do. But I think the, the important thing is, that, yeah. And Turing says that the situation of artificial intelligence exists if you can mm -hmm. sit in an office, <coughs> talk to, to something, mm -hmm. and the responses you get uh, are indistinguishable from what you think the responses would be from a human. Right. That's his, his It's called the Turing yeah. test, yeah. The Turing test, and that was popularized recently in the movie The Imitation Game. The Imitation Game, game yeah. Hmm. No, and, and the interesting thing is, if you look at some of the arguments on this, see, one of the problems is, suppose the, the, the idea is the human being sitting on the other side of the screen, and, you know, or uh, there's a screen between the two, whatever you are, and there's either a human being or a machine on the other side. And if you can't tell the difference between the way it responds, then it's human, effectively. Now, of course, the problem is we accept a lot of stupidity from human beings. I mean, uh, human beings can be schizoid. And you might say, well, that's human. And the machine, then it gets kind of funny. Can you really rule that out as a response? You know, you say to the machine, good morning, and it says, you know, my mother wears army boots or something. <laughs> well, I mean, a human being could say that. I just said that. <laughs> but that is, that's, that's the test. I don't think there's any doubt, for example. Now, here's where I might go. You know, you had these two prominent uh, movies. One was uh, The Theory of Everything about, uh, uh, what's his name? Stephen Hawking. Hawking. Stephen Hawking and the imitation game about Turing. And I don't think there's any doubt that both of those were, were put out in the context, at least, of convincing people, first of all, that these two guys were geniuses, and that this is science. Now, what it, Hawking is famous for recently saying, 
that we should stop artificial intelligence because it's going to get smarter than us and uh, suppress us. And of course, Turing, you know, there's a good reason to believe he was autistic. I mean, he probably was oppressed at some level. But he also had a lot of problems with mathematics. There were certain kinds of mathematics he couldn't do. I saw a note from him that was just sold at some auction where he says, you know, uh, you know, these binomial equations are a pain in the neck or something like that. But uh, so this idea that this is genius. I mean, a lot of science has been massively dumbed down. If you compare it to, uh, uh, you know, the kind of mind that Einstein or Mendeley or Vernadsky, you know, see the one guy who carried but into the 20th century a different approach to science, particularly on this question of life, obviously, and life's relationship to the abiotic. That's a whole different direction. In a sense, that's the direction that Lynn comes from. But Lynn actually comes, I also think, from a, from a direction that while he finds, um, you know, Vernadsky's congenial, okay, where, which, when you really, what, what you're really getting with Lynn is what you see with Riemann, Leibniz, et cetera, because they're f focusing as well on the, uh, the mind directly in the case of Riemann. He might not be right in every detail, but they're asking themselves, he's asking himself, what is the nature of the universe that mind is an efficient cause. And that sort of, you know, you, you, that has to stand there as some standard. That's why Lynn's relationship as a physical economist is crucial to the whole view he's got on science. Because he starts from the idea that it's crea the creativity of the human individual that's the nature of value. It's not infrastructure. It's not even just a science driver. That's just what you need to express the creativity. That to have, to know that you're at the forefront of creative human activity, you need a science driver. By the same token, you need a, 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 to a whole different view of culture. If you don't have that, you're not going to get an ongoing process of development. And that's why the uh, machine tool principle is A universal characteristic that anyone can practice anywhere. I mean, once you've actually put it in machine tool form, that it's applicable universally right, with respect to that domain of, of, mm -hmm. of experiment. And um, you know, this whole idea of preventing the scientist from being pigeonholed or narrowed right. into, you know, the, 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 like in the case of the World War One thing, mm -hmm. is, is crucial. Because that's that's what you know, when Lynn says that Hamilton's conception of economics. That's what mind and character. Mm -hmm. um, that's you know, we're talking about this domain because this is what, this, of course, is what they were working on and all of the things that they were trying to establish. The capability was not to create, you know, hydroelectric power, create this right. or that or the other. That's the whole point. But the mind, these, you know, the mind with the you know, increasing the objects, right, of enterprise for the mind. Mm -hmm. but, but but the notion wasn't economic in the way that people think, except where, ec where economy means, right, uh, precision. You know, the idea, in other words, of bringing processes together that were not previously mm -hmm. together, and then they're focused into, an, uh, you know, uh, if you want to put it that way, but increasing density of singularity. Mm -hmm. These ideas are all the same ideas. This, this yep. uh, the machine tool principle lets you get at it all. Mm -hmm. I think one interesting thing to lo lo look at, and then we should probably break here, is, um, Children, you know, in, in, a f in an important way, w the way you deprive a child is not, is not so much what you think just, okay, they have to eat, they have to have all these things, but they have to have access to, even in their early childhood, a certain quality of power over the environment around them that expresses the level of science and technology of the culture and also challenges them to deal with it and even, uh, you know, uh, attempt actual experiments. But this means that, for example, a child has to have mm. access to electricity or motors or, meta, you know, certainly some idea of meta or microscopes or telescopes. So the child has to have an array of objects which express mm. 
or are part of the relative advancement of the culture, as well as things like musical instruments and uh, you know the ability to do all kinds of other things, you know, language availability and so forth, multiple languages. So you, the child has to have a certain richness of culture that also comes up to the level of science of the society, the most advanced society. Otherwise, that's a deprived child. Now, it's true, you may not get there for everybody, and it may, you know, you, it doesn't mean don't feed the child because he, he, he's still deprived, but you have to think of the child as deprived if they're not given that access. You know, <clears throat> what you presented Sort of remind me how shocking it is to first meet Lynn in, in terms of his focus on creativity per se mm -hmm. and a, a solution which has no apparent roots in the deductive system. And when any of us met Lynn, it was in complete contradistinction to everything we knew from the educational system, which goes back to probably to the role that R Russell had in yeah. shaping the whole 20th century education. Right. Biology is, is molecules, et cetera. Science is logic. And apparently the interesting guy to look at in the United States, something I've never really looked at much at him, is Dewey, who had a big impact on the U.S. education system and China. He spent as much time in China as more time than Russell did. Yeah, the, the, the use of Dewey is what destroyed Herbart's mm -hmm. influence in, in American education. Mm -hmm. Because it, the German influence in the German educational model was the model right. all the way through the 1880s, 1890s. You know, and, and Herbart's specific point is that education is for the moral improvement of the child. And that that's what you're actually able right. to do. You know? Yep. So yeah, that's, def that's definitely what you can do. But anyway, yeah. As you well as the relationship with Trotsky, too. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Too. The whole thing, the left, is, it's amazing. Yeah. All right, we should it's a break for five yeah. minutes or so. All right. Hey. <laughs>